on the left. Um, Jim is our staff member. So I can go ahead and present an update. You know, uh, I brought an extra staff report in case you wouldn't look at that. Here's a good idea. Do you want to go to the plan? No, grab it. Grab it. Grab it. All of the relevant documents that are being applied to this did somebody take the other staff report? It's ready to go. You can just pass it around all the other staff reports. Okay. Um, Jim, do you So, we had a, an outreach meeting. Um, a lot of people came out. There was a lot of discussion. Um, the long and the short of it is after going through the process, um, of looking at all of the documents and really sort of drilling down deep into the permits that have existed for 30 or 40 years. Um, we came up with a, a conclusion that what they're asking for with what they propose um, seems to comply to everything that's in the code today. Um, so I guess I can go through and explain that if anybody is interested in understanding what I understand, but it was a long process. The original project that was proposed um, talked about five different properties, or five different buildings, and a campus. And the campus was the, the Hampton buildings as well as the Main Street buildings. Um, and, and when I say Hampton buildings, there's buildings on both sides of Hampton as well. Um, and when they were originally uh, applied for their permit, um, the original concept was is that they were making a less than 10% increase in occupant level throughout the entire campus. And the campus, again, being all of these different structures. And it's true that the application read correctly and the city processed it correctly. However, there were some underlying issues that the city wasn't aware of that we became more aware of as we continued to dig into exactly how did they get where they got. So the, the part that immediately struck me and, and some of the other people on the committee and, and on the board was how do you start off with a 60,000 square foot project at 13,000 square feet and cost less than 10%. But it was based on occupant load and not on square footage. So the occupant load of the entire campus, it was clearly more than 10% increase and that's how the city ended up approving it. Um, on on the, the other side, that I think that the city did not consider was that as soon as they took into consideration of the entire campus, they didn't take a look at what were all of the other underlying conditions that existed on all of the other structures as one large combined project. Even though only one portion of the project was being modified, the other four portions all had to be looked at as well because they were combining them. So the solution as we went through this was, of course, not to shut them down or to employer in our community would like them. We would like wearing somebody else's hat and they don't have to do that. Um, but the, the answer was to try and understand exactly what did they have and what could they do with what they had. And, and as it turned out, the, one of the biggest questions that had to be answered was the use of the existing building by digital domain. Um, and in the initial set of permits that we received, um, the uses of the building all talked about being industrial. And the industrial storage warehouse that was there back in the 70s when all of these different certificates of occupancy were being documented, um, a storage warehouse has a much different parking requirement than an office structure. The part that we didn't realize and that I don't think that the city knew at the time that the city approved it as a big campus was that they could have applied for and received their permits without making it a big campus because there was a missing set of documents. And the missing set of documents was done by a guy named Frank Geary back in the mid-80s. And when Chaya Bay wasn't able to build the original binoculars building, he moved into what is now called the Digital Domain Building or Hampton Building and 
Frank Gehry converted the entire building with a certificate of occupancy that was approved at the time in the mid-80s um, to an office use. So what's there today is a legal office use. So what they were doing then was just adding more square footage, 13,000 more square feet to an existing office use. Um, so then the question comes in, well, okay, well, if you're adding 13,000 square feet of office use and you have to apply one parking space for every 250 square feet of floor area, what is the required number of parking spaces? And it came out to, and I don't know the number off the top of my head, it was 50 something, 54. Um, it actually, it, it's, it says, it says in this stuff, if 50, 53 new parking spaces, if 53 new parking spaces was required. So, um, again, going back to the original permits, one of the, the, the conditions that the property was allowed to have, um, all the way back to the late 70s, 77, I believe, um, was the right to be able to stack cars with an attendant on site. And that's a recorded document that's been there for 40 years. So by looking at their requirement today, uh, we need to add 53 parking spaces for the 13,000 square feet. And looking at their original uh, ability to be able to do attendant parking with valet parking on site and restriping their existing parking lot. And mind you, their parking lot is a strange configuration because it encompasses several properties. But all of the properties have been tied together since the late 70s. Um, they're able to park the 53 cars they need in Tampa in the drawings that they presented to the community. Um, all of the documents are available through the public forum downtown, or if you want to trust city folk to post the documents, you can download them there for free without having to make the drive downtown. Otherwise, you can go downtown to the figure road and pull them all yourself. Um, but all the documentation is there, and uh, at this point, I don't really see why there's any particular reason um, to not approve the project as presented. Now, mind you, the project as presented has been shifted slightly. They are no longer asking for a campus approval. They're no longer asking for the under 10% within this waiver. They have applied to Coastal for a full coastal development permit, um, and they will uh, have to go before that body and present their case. Uh, show how they're parking it for code for requirement. But again, all of that information is online uh, or available here tonight if anybody wants to see it. That's all I have to say about the project. The applicants here, if we want to hear from the applicant. Yeah, let's hear from them. There's a whole team of them here. And all
we'll go reference that to project. I think we can, I think we can reference that because we have a set of lines that okay. show exactly 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 what something that box is what that box is. And I guess if we need to do most we need to do is just go back and look at it afterwards and then decide at some future point was there any reason to still look at that. So let's do let's move forward. I'm fine with that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna close the presentation and open the public time. Google's part of it, and I think that 
to engage in that conversation uh, is more than trying to read between the lines on some development that you're doing. Um, I think it's a bigger issue, and I commend you for your community meeting, but I don't uh, agree with how this is per, uh, proceeding, and I don't think that a land use committee of the Venice Neighborhood Council has any place in uh, adding uh, these kinds of conditions to a development that do directly may or indirectly between the lines address some very serious social um, consequences and economic consequences that Google has brought into our community. I, I really think it's important that we look uh, on a, a more um, a broader or organic scale that includes other uh, agents that maybe aren't part of the land use committee. Thank you. Deborah? Yeah, hi, I'm Mark Deborah Schemer, and um, thank you for addressing the questions. Um, I, too, am very concerned, not exactly about the same issue. I'm concerned that there aren't enough social sanctions on there. I think that because uh, when Google, and it might not be all you guys' fault, and I'm not blaming you for this necessarily, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, really. I don't have any idea. But I do know that since Google has moved in, uh, since even there were rumors of you guys moving in, that one, there have been harsher penalties for people uh, on the boardwalk. They've been pushed off the boardwalk, the homeless people onto 3rd Street, because that's the only place that isn't residential that they can find to, to be at. And they get kicked around every five minutes by some kind of resident. They're trying not to be a nuisance. So they're on 3rd Street. They're going to be right at your property. I would like to know how you are going to address this situation. Are you going to keep criminalizing them and persecuting them along with the city, not giving them bathrooms, not giving them trash cans, not giving them a place to store their stuff, but then per prosecuting them for doing so? Or are you going to really assist these people that are now your neighbors already that need help? You have money. You have resources. You could install a bathroom, public bathroom on the corner there. Uh, you have plenty of money that you could do that. That's one thing that you could do. You could make sure that uh, that more uh, that more um, humane solutions to insist because you're such a big part of this community now. You can insist that the council member, that the council people, and the uh, mayor, and the city of Los Angeles, if not uh, only Venice, but specifically Venice, address these issues in a humane way, a humane and just way, and they don't get pushed around just because, now I've read a lot of what happened in Silicon Valley when you guys moved in, and it's not good. You guys don't look good in that scenario. I would hope that because you're moving down here to this beautiful community, and supposedly love it, and that's why you supposedly moved here, that you would support all of our community and not just the wealthy developers that are, you know, licking your feet right now. So I would like to know how you would address that problem. All right, so we're, we're, um, we're going to go through all the public comments and then um, allow the applicant to respond. Uh, Sue Kaplan, please. Oh, um. Um, I guess my other question is, um, I, I'm a little confused how we're going to be, what, how we're talking about a project that doesn't exist, even on paper. But um, my question is that I know that several, um, the plans, Jim, the plans, um, that when you first moved in, you built this wonderful theater, outdoor theater, on top of removing parking spaces. And I'm wondering if we're going to see those parking spaces. Or that. In, this, in this part of the project. Could you speak up, please? Oh, I'm not Sam Brown. I live in the 300 block of Vernon. I've been there since 89. Um, I didn't get an outreach notice, so I'm going to admit right now I'm in the dark. And um, when you are addressing everybody, we can oh, share this. Name and title. And I am just clarifying. The buildings that you are in are the block um, between Rose and Sunset and between Camp Hampton and Maine, pretty much, except the Rose Cafe, right? And then the next block on the other side of that, right? From Digital Domain through Gold Gym. And do you also own the parking lot city corner from Gold Gym? Oh, okay. 
We don't have, we don't own any of it. We don't own any of it. It's all leased. Yes, we do not own any of the buildings. I didn't answer the question, but I need this just to be kind of focused. Oh, I'm sorry, you're supposed to answer at the end. Sorry. It's okay. So here we go. I know that you are powerful because there's a stop sign in the middle of the block. <laughs> <laughs>
providing not parking without spending and cheating the neighbourhood. You have the money to do that. Please consider the neighbourhood and not put more of a burden on us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our final public comment is Jed Walker. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, there's been a lot of um, interesting comments said in the audience. I, I just read the staff report. I think it's a good report. And I, and I, I appreciate that we're getting a, a good sense of, of what the code, the regulations, uh, the regulation issues are here. I think one of the things that Google is here for, for voluntarily here for tonight, is to hear what their impact on the community might be, how to adjust if necessary, as necessary, what they're doing for the sake of the community that they're increasingly moving into, if I can put it that way. What I'd like to hear from Lupin, who is appointed, each of whose members is appointed by the board to help represent the community, to help understand the community's impact. What I'd like to hear from each Lupin member is what they may have looked at understanding their history of that area and the impact that this kind of project is going to have on the community. Yeah. Alright, so before we do uh, that closing um, public comment, um, you want to respond to any questions Jay done? I think I have some other questions that were raised. Yes.
computer classes, training, arts, works, um, associations with the science industry, so there's been such healthy list of, of contributions that have gone back into the different things, and I think that's something that should be shared if you are interested in the um, I think it's important to note that since the Venice Family Clinic is uh, listed there are a lot. Oh, I'm part of our. Can you stand up? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Since the Art Walk has been hosted at Google, I'm Terry Lasowski. I work with Google. Uh, since the Art Walk has been hosted at Google, we've doubled the amount of money that the Venice Family Clinic has been able to raise uh, from that one event. And last year, they raised over $700,000 just from the one event. So, and that's in two weeks again in our space. So the only question I've had, this is going to be a 212 car parking space. Correct. And because of the or, the valley during all business hours and the restriping, that means an additional 53 physical parking spaces to what would be in today. Uh, correct, which gets us up to the 212. But let me make it clear, this is not valet, this is the attendant. This is an attendant staff parking lot, not a valet <coughs> service. Okay. So but technically that's a big difference. So this adds 53 physical parking spaces to a total of 212 okay. with an attendant staff. 53 parking spaces to a total of 159 So 53 new physical spaces to a total of 212, which means one for 250 per square feet for off of offices. Of the new 13 more than the new space.
recreating the parking lot to create something new, but because you're using an existing parking lot and only restriking it, and the restriking is allowing them to have tandem parking, there is no requirement for the landscape workers to park. Because it's an existing parking lot. They're not rebuilding the parking lot, they're only using the attendant to park in the yard. They're using the attendant to park in the yard. Yeah, yeah, I'm the first person to talk about landscaping and parking, but, but the, the, the landscape ordinance for parking lots applies when you're building a new parking lot. They're using an existing parking lot and they're parking in the aisles. They're, they're doing attendant parking in the aisles. They're not creating the parking lot. They're not altering the parking lot. They're, they're just restriking the paint. I mean, that's not.